Carol, and thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike, do you want to say any words before we dive into the detail, or do I take it from here? Well, no, I don't think so. I think uh, you characterized it. We've got to validate our um, uh, definition of legal entity. We've mm -hmm. got to validate the concept of grouping and see that you've uh, reinterpreted it correctly in the model. And then yeah. we're going to get the uh, um, conceptual structure of funds and set us up so we can uh, dive into that wonderful subject. Fantastic. Thanks. Okay, so um, what I'll do then, I'll take us to the model and uh, we'll start with uh, a couple of things that we uh, added last time and changes that we've made and I'll just go through those one by one and uh, see if we've uh, got those right. So um, starting on this diagram here, we, uh, we have a couple of things. We've got the hierarchy, which starts from autonomous entity legal entity and then just a few of things under legal entity. Off to the right here we have these legal capacities. So just as a reminder, everything in this model is a set theory uh, set. It basically defines things according to uh, properties that we can say about them. So once we've worked out what the reality is, the model sort of models itself. You know, we, uh, we simply make sure that we've uh, defined the fact that, that put something into a given set and then uh, you know, those legal facts are, are reflected quite straightforwardly. So the main fact we've been focusing on is the different kinds of legal capacity. Now previously I'd mislabeled one of these. I talked about uh, legal entity as anything that could sign a contract and so I referred, back to, referred to that as signatory capacity. That was misleading. Um, legal entity as anything that could sign a contract is what we talk about is the capacity of the entity. So a better word for that is contractual capability. This is the stuff we're interested in for LEI, anything that can enter into a contract or a transaction or whatever. And the thing that we call signatory capacity, uh, we've created as a separate kind of capacity. And this is a capacity that is actually that of some party, some individual in some role, which is a signatory. So now we're able to say things about how uh, organizations don't sign contracts on their own part. They have some agent who is a signatory. So we have legal entity, has agent, signatory, and that signatory must be some human being, some legal, uh, natural person, that's a human being who's obviously old enough to be a signatory. So that redefines right, as a new term. Let's pause, right, Mike, let's pause right there for one second. Yep. Mm -hmm. Make sure everybody's comfortable that you've made that change to contractual capability and signatory capability, our capacity, and make sure there's no questions mm -hmm. or problems. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. So any comments from anybody, please uh, raise your hand or pop something in the questions queue, which I'm keeping an eye on as well. Does it make Steve. sense to everybody? Fantastic. So, and that was one that several people we came up with it in the session and, and afterwards as well. I, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the uh, observations log, but I've been tracking all of these questions and comments both in session and by email. So I think that was pretty uh, well. Uh, uh, just, okay, just go over that, Mike. Where are the comments? Where should people be looking for these comments? Right. There's a spreadsheet. Uh, it's on the Semantics Repository uh, website, which you can link to from the EDM Council site in the business entities section under notes. Uh, would you like me to go there now just to show you? Just just show them how to get there real quick and let's make sure everybody knows mm -hmm. what to do. Yeah, good idea. So I'll just I'll in here, www.edmcouncil.org and from there, this is my slow machine, uh, from there you will see a um, link to the semantics repository, there it is. So just there under key resources on the home page. And any minute now it will let me click on it. Um, I can say this is my slow machine. There it goes. So you open up the semantics repository. This is our structure that contains all the diagrams of the draft material and all the rest of it and the legal entities or sorry, business entities section um, which you can get to from a, a menu on the left there. 
uh, you're, you're tending to fade out a bit, Mike. Please just um, um, project as hard as you can. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so on the semantics repository site, which comes up from that link that I just clicked, on the menu here we have the different sections with all the graph material. Near the bottom here we have business entities. Click on that, you'll see the diagrams from the uh, previous draft of some of the changes we made. And this will be updated with today's changes, of course. And there's a tab at the top called Notes. So this is where everything is going to be. This is where our original presentation is that we started from. This is where the review notes uh, from last week and again from uh, this week will go. And this is the observation log, which is an Excel spreadsheet. So I'm going to open that up. Here it comes. All that. And here we have um, your expenses. Yeah, that's classified. <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I was hoping nobody saw that. It's probably frozen on the screen at that very point. <laughs> so uh, right. it seems to have frozen now, but uh, I'm using an old version of Excel. So you'll see that. Um, okay, well, let's, let's get back to it. So, so the. the uh, um, it's in the repository, under notes, under observation log, look at the spreadsheet, direct comments, email back to you, right, Mike? Absolutely, yes. And you'll right. find that what I've done since last time is I've put an initial response in the initial response column, and I've classified the questions according to the scope of the question, whether it relates to the legal entities, taxonomy, organization, funds, and so on. So, uh, uh, Do you have a resolution tab on this that says this is open or closed or something? Uh, I've got whether the change was required and whether it's been actioned. Um, okay. Yes, I, it might make more sense Good. to just have an open and close. Yeah. Fantastic. Let's, let's get back to it. So, yes, thanks, Mike. And keep the comments coming. And as you'll see, this is the mix of both uh, in session comments and uh, uh, emails, anything except you know, your microphone's not working or something like that. So, um, you'll see that there was. Uh, a few comments that relate to this uh, signatory capacity versus contractual capability. And I think uh, since nobody's said otherwise, it sounds like uh, that's a yes to how we've uh, dealt with that. So that means we have contractual capability as being what defines something as being the member of the set of things which are a legal entity. So there's anything that can enter into a contract. Now, the next comment we had last week was that it would be simpler to simply break legal entity down into corporate entity, people's, sovereign entity, and fund vehicles. So we're going to look at fund vehicles today, so I haven't uh, put that in here yet. What I've got here is sovereign uh, a body corporate, which is a corporate entity, which is a natural fiction in law that creates a legal uh, a person, and natural person, which of course is a uh, uh, a, a human being that's uh, also a uh, legal entity uh, and also a uh, legal person, in fact. Now, each of these three kinds of thing have one property in common, which is that they're capable of liability. So, uh, I want to make a proposal here. The thing we said last time was that these things would all go directly under legal entity. Uh, and there are some things that are not capable of liability, such as trusts, for example. Uh, I'm so, sorry, if you're yeah. typing, please go on mute. Thank you. Mm. Thanks. I was just wondering <laughs> what that was. Thanks, Mike. Um, uh, good. So, um, keeping it simple, we have these kinds of entity under legal entity. There are others um, elsewhere, such as trusts and so on, which we'll also come to when we look at the funds thing. But first, I want to suggest something. And again, this comes back to the set theoretic nature of the, of the model and the fact that everything is defined by its, uh, its properties. So sovereigns, uh, body corporate, and legal a natural person all have the property that they are capable of incurring liability. So that's the ability to be sued at law. So it would be valid and perhaps sensible to do this. Uh, find the right diagram, which is to define a concept which is the parent of all three, which is any uh, 
and, and there's already a legal term for this, legal person, any entity which can incur liability. So that means instead of these three being directly under legal entity, because they're all legal persons, we can group them together, say that all of these are things which are capable of liability, and then of course things like trusts and, and uh, partnerships and so on uh, would not be part of that grouping, but they'd still come under legal entity. Um, so that's and that would mean we don't need these three properties here because they're all inherited in the same way that if we say that uh, mammals and fish and birds are all vertebrates, we only need to say once that they have a backbone. So that kind of grouping allows us to simplify the model, um, but it does move us away from what we said last time in this note about having, uh, having these types of things just directly under legal entity. So I want to propose that we define legal person as a parent of these three things that are capable of incurring liability and is defined as anything which can incur liability because then in other uh, models uh, you can talk about uh, something which must be a legal person but you may not care what kind of legal person it is for example uh, uh, um, a fund uh, or something like that may be able to be more than one kind of thing or a business or a non-profit and so on some of those kinds of things can be any legal entity some kinds of thing must be a legal person, and so on. So, does anybody feel strongly that we either should or shouldn't uh, um, put legal person in here as a common parent of these three things? It would not be a parent of things that are not incorporated, such as uh, part okay, non important. Let's let people react. Right, we got it. Let's let's get reaction. Let's make sure we understand. We understand what you're doing. Is there any problems with that? My concern is with the, the notion of liability. Um, <clears throat> I can see capable of liability would be like a, a yes-no thing, but I, I can't see that you'd actually have instances of liability and track instances of liability against each instance of person. Right, that's a very good point. I think, um, uh, well, I think what we're trying to do here is define the capacity as a legal capacity. Um, but you're, you're right, in, a, uh, in an application where you're looking at uh, instance data, you wouldn't necessarily want to reflect all the uh, legal nuances as actual classes of things, so you would replace that uh, blue line here that's a property uh, with a boolean. I think that would be a, a, a very valid uh, implementation uh, uh, approach. Mike. I've got two. Does that two make sense? Pete, does that, Pete, does that satisfy you? Oh, before before you move on, Carol. Pete, are you are you comfortable with that? Yeah, I, I think I, it it would just be a, a property, not not um, a specific class in its own right. Mm. And, and same with um, contractual capability, I think. Absolutely, yes. So all of these in an application would just be booleans that you uh, yes no properties that you would put in the class here, uh, and only in this. Uh, more legally focused view would we talk about actual things which are legal capacities because as you quite rightly say there will never be instance data for a capacity. So that's absolutely right. Okay, Carol, um, does your comment relate to uh, the structure of legal person liability? Uh, there are two two aspects. Robert Schmidt has just raised his hand. Robert, do you want to? Uh... Okay. Uh, this, this is Bob Schmidt. Um, uh, slightly off topic, but in the last meeting, I think a point was raised that um, the label legal person uh, should not apply to a natural person and that legal persons and natural persons were actually disjoint. So that um, I just wanted to make sure that, that that very carefully constructed note from last week was respected. Mm -hmm. mm. I believe it was an email yeah, that was, was received and read out. Uh, okay. I will. I will just kind of append my to my comment that I generally agree with the direction that we're going. Great. So Thanks. Michael, so a natural really... person. Thanks. Yeah, so if, if you recall the the email from last week, there was uh, almost a legal opinion uh, rendered that mm -hmm. that uh, that the use of legal person to apply to a natural person was uh, not logical. Yes, that's right, and and uh, you're, you're quite right. This is really a, a matter of 
of, of labeling and I think let's see if we can get the labels right now so um, can I um, I'm sorry if I'm, am I, I don't know if I'm still on but a solution yes. that might be offered is that right now you only have one subtype underneath legal entity and it might be possible to simply eliminate the legal person and and, and subtype the sovereign body corporate and natural person to legal entity directly yeah, that was going to be my question is what, why we only had one or was, is there an intent to have other subtypes under legal entity? Right. Is that Julian Macri? Yes, it is. Excellent. Your question was next in the queue. Uh, what other subclass is there under legal entity? Um, so there are several. Um, basically, if legal entity is anything that can uh, uh, enter into some contractual arrangement, then that includes not only um, these, and we will relabel them because I don't want to uh, lose that last uh, comment. I think we need to get these labels uh, as, as close as they can be to how things are understood. But under legal entity, two other significant ones, and I'll move these into the same diagram, are uh, uh, trusts and uh, partnerships. And they so, cannot accrue liabilities? That's right. They can enter into a contract, but the liability unwinds unless it's an incorporated partnership or unless it's a uh, kind of uh, um, trust that can be, uh, uh, that is constituted under some uh, jurisdiction as a uh, legal person. Mm -hmm. And perhaps legal person is the wrong label, but it is a label that's been quite widely attested in the past, but I hope we can find a better label for it because uh, legal personhood. Um, well, let me just pull out a bit of language from a couple of the uh, uh, LEI related documents because uh, I think this is where it's important that we reflect the, the legal opinions as closely as, as we can as per the, uh, the previous comment. So um, uh, it says, for example, under LEI standard entity coverage, LEIs can be assigned to a legal person or structure that is organized under the corporate laws of any jurisdiction. Uh, now, legal person here implicitly does exclude human beings to, to um, that previous point. Um, also says you know, investment vehicles, mutual funds, alternative investment vehicles, hedge funds, etc., etc., can be identified by means of LEI regardless of whether they are incorporated or constituted in some other way, e.g., trust, partnership, contractual, etc. We'll see that when we look at the fund uh, model in detail. So, um, the legal person here. Uh, I mean, I don't know if there's anybody uh, legal there. Legal personhood is something which uh, generally applies to um, uh, any uh, human being uh, and also anything that's created by some uh, legal fiction, for want of a better word, which uh, brings that legal person into existence in that jurisdiction without them being a human being. But very often when we use the label legal person, as we see here, it's implied to be mutually exclusive with human beings. So we really have two meaningful concepts here and right. only one label to go around. So let's see, even if we use longer labels, what is the most unambiguous label that describes what we mean by, in this case, anything with legal personhood, that is a sovereign, a corporate, you know, body corporate, that's a, a non-natural legal person, or a human being over the age of majority. And we had some comments last week on, on whether that idea of a adult human being should be a relative thing because the same person could be regarded differently in different jurisdictions. Right. I'd like to come back and discuss that um, next because I am still struggling with how to uh, re reflect that. Um, now, I'm not an so expert the, so on... The question, Mike, is do, do you need to change the label or do you need to add a note of explanation? Right, exactly. That is the question. And. Can I um, Yes, Can I make a suggestion? I mean, I'm, I know I'm not, an, I'm not an expert on legal terms, so maybe legal person is the right thing to call it, but it seems to me if, if the main um, reason it exists in the object model is primarily because it has that capacity to accrue liability, yep. I would be inclined to call it a liable entity because then it's very descriptive of kind of what and why it's even there. Um, I like that. That would be me, right? So that would kind of keep it consistent with its main description, and you don't have to go read a description. You can kind of 
ah, okay, it's something, it's liable entity and accrues liability. To me, legal person kind of generates confusion to me, especially since it seems like it really doesn't include true human person. But again, I'm not an expert on legal terms, so I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. That's, that's very useful. And um, this comes back to, uh, I guess, what we're trying to do here, which is to find set theoretic constructs which are not only clearly defined by the properties that they have, but also have uh, at least reasonably useful and, and non-confusing names. And sometimes getting the accurate legal term, like legal person, causes more questions than, than it solves. And so, let's be let's be careful. Our our default should be to adopt the legal definition if it exists. Right. If there is a synonym or a, um, a a better descriptive word, put it in parentheses or add it as a synonym. But let, let's be careful about changing established legal terms. Right. But okay. This doesn't change the established legal term. This makes it. This makes the model clearer. You can you can link to the established legal term here, and make this model still have its purpose. Right. Um, I think. I mean. I don't know if you see on the uh, bottom right here. We have the concept of a synonym. I put legal person as in as a synonym here. Now again, I'm assuming, and I'd like to hear from from legal folks. This. Um, grouping of things that can incur liability uh, does include human beings as well as uh, uh, artificially created or, or, or you know, natural fiction uh, body corporates, as well as um, um, sovereigns. So uh, I've always understood legal person to be the more accurate legal term for that, but liable entity is more self-descriptive. At the end of the day, the labels don't well, they matter because they, they need to be clear, but um, the meaning comes from what are the facts we assert about this thing. Uh, the label should make it reasonably clear what we meant by that uh, class, and as Mike says, it should be as... Uh, no, no, I, I accept that, Mike. I accept the premise that we go with the definition, not with the label. And mm -hmm. if the label is not wrong and more descriptive, I'm okay with it. Okay. So does anybody feel strongly either way about the label liable entity? And just to clarify, this there's nothing in here that says this is an organization or that it's not a human being. So we're still talking about things which include all three of sovereign, body, corporate, and natural person, which is anything that you can sue at law um, and that the, the actual liability uh, accrues to. Feel free to type in the comments or raise a hand if anybody uh, feel strongly one way or another. Robert Smith, you have raised your hand. Is it uh, a point at the moment? Uh, yes, um, just mm. briefly. I, I don't think we can hold ourselves to a strict hierarchy here. I think we're going to have to allow that certain base entities, um, like natural person, might belong to more than one supertype. So, for instance, uh, in the diagram as it stands right now, we have sovereign set aside as somehow not a liable per, liable entity. And I, I think, in fact, it would be true that, that sovereigns could be held liable. And so I think that I think that we're going to have to allow for circumstances where certain uh, leaf level entities, uh, such as natural person, must be allowed to belong to more than one superclass. Absolutely. Well, obviously, sovereign has a capable of liability. Am I misinterpreting something here? That's Depend correct. Depends on exactly how you're or how you're interpreting the the subtyping of legal entity. But the point was raised. Well, do we have only liable entity as a subtype of legal entity? And then it was responded that no, that there are certain trusts that aren't liable, and so the trusts were were brought into under the legal entity as distinct from liable entity. And I understood mm -hmm. that, um, mm -hmm. but. I think that if we try to restrict ourselves to a, a hierarchical scheme, I think the real world just doesn't doesn't work that way. That the, the hierarchies always end up um, mm. being inadequate to the to the task. And I so I think that if if we are going to if we're going to establish that these are mutually exclusive subtypes, trust and liable entity, then you have to question sovereign. Right. Excellent. So that is uh, uh, very important. Uh, observation and a very important difference between 
what you would extract from this from any uh, data model where you would expect to have a single hierarchy versus how we model uh, things in the world. So by way of analogy, you could say that, uh, for example, a whale is in the taxonomy of species, a whale is a mammal. So you could also say a whale is a marine animal and you classify it alongside fish and octopi and so on, which are also marine animals. And so we, throughout the model, we support exactly what you just said. These are set theoretic constructs. These upward pointing arrows mean that they inherit the facts from the thing above. But something like, for example, a natural person inherits both all the facts that accrue to any human being, so its date of birth, its gender, and so on, and it inherits all the facts that apply to any uh, liable entity. Similarly, the sovereign, that only has one superclass here, and there may be more sets that it belongs to, uh, but this upward pointing arrow means that it inherits this fact about liable entity that it's capable of liability. So the model explicitly does say, uh, even if we were to move this other relationship down here, it does say that a sovereign is an entity that is capable of accruing liability. But it's very important, and you've absolutely hit the nail on the head, it's very important that things can belong to more than one set. So for example, if we look at uh, some of the earlier uh, taxonomies, now of course there's been changes in this diagram since we built it, but um, you see that, uh, for example, a legally incorporated partnership is both a partnership, which is a kind of legal entity, but it's also a body corporate, a kind of liable entity or legal person, um, because it's a legally incorporated partnership, as distinct from some other kinds of partnership, like limited partnership, which are not. So this multiple inheritance, in fact, when we get to the, uh, I think the, the corporate for example, uh, is uh, many of these things are actually uh, in three sets of kinds of things. They are, um, that's not a good example, um, so a corporate company is both a body corporate and a formal organization. The formal organizations are autonomous entities, just like legal entities and human beings are, and many of the things we're interested in, with the obvious exception of human beings, are both a legal entity and a formal organization. So we make very extensive use of this multiple inheritance and uh, it's particularly important that we uh, get that right, that we understand uh, uh, what the uh, uh, implications are when those are shown. Does that answer your question? Well, it's a fundamental part of this uh, activity, Mike. We, we want to make sure that people understand that, that this is not a yes. data model, is that what you're saying, that this describes the facts about, not the restrictions for implementation of? Yep. Absolutely. Um, so, did that answer the last speaker's question? Thank you very much. Excellent, my pleasure. Um, and thank you for the comment, because this is uh, exactly what we're here for. And, you know, although it may seem a bit difficult to read at first, um, as we understand the facts, uh, we're hoping that we've been able to put them down in an unambiguous way, so that then when you're designing applications or messages or anything else, you've got a single thing to refer to that represents the uh, business facts as they're understood. So that was, that was fantastic, thank you. Um, Okay, so it looks like we've got uh, a change of label for a liable entity with a synonym of legal person. Uh, it includes natural person, body corporate, and sovereign. We have legal entity, which is anything that has the capacity to enter into a contract, this contractual capability, which was previously wrongly named. And that, so for example, and I'd like to hear from any legal people to make sure we've got this right. If you um, have some contractual agreement or relationship with a trust, for example, uh, you're uh, uh, it's trading with it in uh, in some securities trade or something, then there's some liability incurred as a result of that trade, but when you go to the trust, or perhaps the partnership is a simpler example, when you go to the partnership, the partnership has incurred some liability, but when you uh, when, if, if they uh, default on something and you, you go to them, the actual liability unwinds to the partners themselves who are considered to be jointly and severally liable for those liabilities that have been taken on by the partnership. Um, trusts, I understand, uh, are similar to that. 
uh, but they may vary considerably from one jurisdiction to another, and that's something uh, we'd like to look at shortly. Um, so that's the distinction between something that is able to take on uh, some contractual relationship and effectively take on liability versus the entity that is actually liable, which in the case of the partnership, you'll see there's this has partner relation to some natural person, and it is those natural persons, two or more of them, which are jointly and separately liable for the uh, um, liabilities that arise from its capacity to enter into some contractual relationship, such as a securities transaction or uh, any kind of contractual relationship. So um, that's what we're looking at now. Um, I'd like to validate whether everybody's comfortable with this or whether there are uh, further uh, or, or any legal inaccuracies in, in any of that, whether we've reflected the legal realities of things in as logical and uh, consistent a way as, as, as possible. Any comments, please? Julian, your line is released. Yes. Um, where would a joint venture that maybe you know is, is amongst two or three mm. or four corporations exist? Um, based on what you're showing here, partnerships are very much human or at least natural person. Right. Joint ventures, if you will. But where would a corporate joint venture exists, because that seems similar to partnership, I think, ah. although I'm not too sure about the libel aspect of a joint venture. Right. Uh, yes, I would like to uh, get to the bottom of that. It was brought up last time as well, and uh, if you'll bear with me, the next change I want to show you will possibly give us the building blocks for joint venture or, or possibly not, and I'm quite okay. sure saying perhaps not, but then I'll show you a couple of other things because this is something that uh, was raised and I haven't worked out exactly how best to, to model it and now would be a really good time to, to narrow it down. So two things I want to look at um, and, and stay, stay uh, un unmuted while we, while we look at this. Um, in the organizations part of the model, so organizations are themselves a kind of autonomous entity which has members which are other autonomous entities. It could be a school of fish, it could be a, um, a, a, a company using our multiple inheritance that we saw just now, so a limited company is both an organization and a, uh, a liable entity, and it is as an organization that it has subunits and so on. Uh, under organization, we have formal organization, I'm going to come back to that in a different diagram, because that's also defined by one specific property, which is that it has some formal agreement amongst its principles. Um, an organization, whatever else there is about it, is a subtype of autonomous entity, which means it acts as an entity in its own right. Now, the other change, this is another change I want to validate, so this was next anyway, um, that we brought in last time, is this new idea of a group. I've called it entities group rather than just groups because I, I wanted a, a less uh, uh, ambiguous label. If there are better labels for it, I'd love to know. But I've defined it as being a kind of collection of things. A collection is a set of any things. Uh, it's a kind of set. Sets have members, collection. It's not really much difference, really, but just to separate out different kinds of set. So anything anywhere in the model that is defined as a collection of things um, is, comes under this class called collection. So there are many other subclasses of this elsewhere in the model. Um, and we define this new thing called an entities group, which is some group of autonomous entities. Now, what distinguishes a group from an organization is the group isn't acting like an entity. It doesn't have autonomy, so it's not a child of autonomous entity, whereas the organization is. And actually, that is what distinguishes a bunch of entities as a group from a bunch of entities that have some self-actualizing behavior. Um, it is this fact that an organization is defined by being not only a, a group of things um, with members, in other words, but also a kind of autonomous entity. Now, um, I think that joint venture, we thought when we talked about this last time, the groups, uh, the joint ventures would come under group, but I am quite uh, inclined from what you're saying to think that a joint venture, as a venture, has some autonomy as a thing, uh, is a kind of formal organization. Um, perhaps not, perhaps it is, but from what you're saying, it sounds like it is. So firstly, before we step on to that, because this is new from last time, this entities group, 
can we validate that we've modeled this right, that it's a group of any and any kind of uh, members that are any kind of autonomous entities, do we need to subclass that to groups that are groups only of legal entities, for example, um, and does this, uh, this change to the model itself uh, look okay? And then we'll come straight on to the joint venture thing. Okay, so any comments, objections? Everybody happy with? Uh, Sorry, Rob, Bob, Bob Smith. Yeah, hi, this is Bob again. Um, I have a, a problem with introducing these highly generic um, entities like entities group and collection into the model because earlier you had said that this was based on a, you know on a set theory and that based on mm -hmm. the facts we would we would describe each of these um, entities such as I know we were talking a moment ago about sovereign for example yep. um, it's very clear to everybody what a sovereign is and what would constitute membership in sovereign in the sovereign entity type uh -huh. whereas when we start introducing these shortcuts like entities group it it muddles things up tremendously so that the temptation to take joint venture and just toss it into the entities group um, it, it starts to actually break down even at this conversational level because suddenly anytime anybody raises some new association you just point over to the entities group thing and, and we move on um, I, I, I just find that these um, highly generic uh, structures in the in our model here is it can be very uh, detrimental right and, and okay. well, well, actually why is that Bob you think is it doesn't uh, carry over the facts of entities group or what what's exactly is the concern that uh, bothers you um, because they become very uh, non-specific uh, it, it bothers me on a number of levels um, let me just see if I can get my thoughts together quickly one of them is is it it becomes a um, it becomes a cheat so that uh, the conversation devolves down to well isn't that just a group of entities and um, uh, it, it allows us to move on um, quickly but often without much good thought and then um, uh, secondly also I think it kind of confuses the levels of abstraction in the model itself so from a methodological standpoint you know entities group is at a much uh, is it a, at a higher level of abstraction than, say, uh, liable entity? I and mean, we all know what a liable entity is now. It's somebody that accrue a liability. But what's an entity's group? It's just it's almost anything. It could be it could be whales and fish for that matter. Um, uh, thirdly, um, I think that it becomes it, it can become very nonspecific. I'll give you an example from our own uh, experience here, where um, we wanted to say, well, there's um, a group of uh, it's actually out of the exact same subject area you know a group of persons and somebody says oh, okay well that'll handle marriage oh that's great so they're, they're married people and then somebody says oh great and that's that'll handle where people work uh, great so we just keep pointing to the same entity but in fact the the types of information that, that would constitute where somebody works and who somebody's married to are are quite different and um, if we don't respect those differences we don't we don't capture the behaviors, the the qualities, um, you know, of those of those things. So, uh, the 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 generic parts of the the model, I think, are are um, uh, at the wrong level of abstraction. They they, they detract from the conversation, and, and they don't carry as as much information as the more specific entities do. Mm. Thank you, um, Mike. Good. I've I've written. I've jotted down some. some Sorry, can I just respond? Uh, I've jotted down some notes on that, and uh, I agree. I want to show you something else before we write off entities group, um, but uh, it's absolutely to your, to your point. So uh, I'll hold that thought. I'll just take uh, the comment that Carol's just bringing through. Go on, Carol. Okay. Uh, Dennis Wisnowski, um, I'm going to release your line, but I know there's background noise there. So um, I know he had a comment on what the previous speaker said. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah. Can, yeah. can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, Thanks, there shouldn't Dennis. be any background noise. I, I don't know who the other speaker was, but I agree with him. I think that this model is coming along very nicely. And when we put things in it like entities group, what happens at the end of a long day or at the end of a meeting is that people just give up and put everything in there. Pretty soon mm -hmm. that becomes the normal way of doing business. 
uh, this needs to be as specific as, as we can make it. So I would encourage more more boxes rather than fewer and more labels on the arrows so that this becomes mm. as unambiguous as we can make it at this point in time. Thanks, Dennis. And uh, I absolutely agree. I'm I'm gonna I'm not gonna delete it just yet because we could find there are times that it's needed, we couldn't find there are not. And uh, my instinct is that we're gonna lose this towards the end of the process. But I think the point that you both made is uh, a very important one, that one can easily be tempted to uh, throw something in there. So I said, for example, that last time we were tempted to consider whether joint venture came under group, and I was about to propose something else whereby it would not. So that does very much illustrate the point that it is very easy to, uh, to throw things into some loosely defined thing like a group of things. Um, uh, where where it should not be, and uh, I think that's uh, we've got to think about how to keep that discipline, particularly when others are extending and applying this model locally. How do we maintain that kind of discipline? And perhaps not having the things that are so loose and so general uh, would be would be the answer. Because I think also um, when we have the you know when we first introduced formal organisation, the the review team that was working on that at the time. Said, well, this is a formal organization, there's also an informal organization, and for things like money laundering and so on, informal organizations are actually quite important. So we actually have that in the model, informal organization. It's defined as being an organization, it's still some autonomous thing, it has some goals and behaviors of its own. And perhaps some of the reasons that entity group was introduced may be better served by informal organization, unless we ever want to refer to groups which are not themselves an organization. So I'm going to leave it in and take it back to the person who suggested it because she's not on this week's call, but we should not use it uh, unless we're really, really sure that we're using it for something which is explicitly and only a group and probably a subclass of this that will be a group of a particular kind of entity because uh, just to clarify and confirm uh, what one of you just said, this could be a school of fish and we mustn't lose sight of that. Yeah, there's nothing about autonomous entity that says it's not a fish and that is yeah, you know, that is why you know we have all these additional properties that bring things into the area that we're actually interested in, uh, in terms of uh, entities that can enter into contracts, um, human beings, and so on and so on. So um, I want to show something which I think will be the best. Before you move on. For, uh, okay, sure. Sorry, there was another raised hand. That was Julian. Julian Macri. Yeah. Yeah, uh, very quickly. Yeah, I, I generally agree with the comments that were just recently made about entities group. I wouldn't necessarily remove it for now. I would suggest that um, maybe before we talk about it again, if it's next week or, or whenever, maybe send out to the group kind of a, a well-worded problem statement that you're trying to mm -hmm. solve with the concept mm -hmm. of entities group. I'm not sure I understood the exact problem wow. you're trying to solve. If, if, if we understood you know what, what it is you're really trying to, what void you're trying to fill. Then I think people might have a better idea, uh, could contribute better towards the solution ultimately. So, because there probably is something that's needed, but maybe not quite as generic. Right. Um, I'm and and maybe what you're trying to get at is party-to-party -party relationships or something to that effect. Maybe that's what, maybe that's the void. But uh, I would define the problem, and then we can solve it. Good. Thank you. If I could just, um, excuse me, throw a thought out there quick about uh, entities group. Um, yeah. I wonder if um, there's a high-level ontology that that um, has a, a corollary concept to entities group, and we could kind of refer to uh, an external ontology for kind of these high-level, very abstract concepts. Yes, that's a very good idea because. Um, just to delve into theory for a, a, a moment, we've used very high degree of abstraction in the very top of this model. Most of that you don't see on these diagrams, but it's there precisely so that we can uh, interoperate across uh, different business areas, different parts of our own business, but also uh, different semantic models uh, that are out there. And over time, we expect to replace more and more of our more abstract things, I'm thinking particularly of the geographical uh, section of the ontology, 
um, some of the address terms, some of the uh, um, uh, date and time terms, for example, which will be replaced with the OMG date time vocabulary. There's all these uh, uh, abstractions which we've created, which we've needed to create to be able to disambiguate things across a, a much wider space than just one application or, or one part of the, of the business. And uh, over time, as more industry standards develop formal ontologies, we expect to replace our abstractions with the ones that are in the standards. And uh, the WCC in particular has stuff on organizations. It has an organization ontology right now. And uh, we've aligned with uh, a few elements of that. And I think we can uh, go back and, and do that more formally. So uh, that's something that may or may not have so, to so do. Mike, if we're not using entities group to define uh, joint ventures and partnerships and the like, what yeah. are we using to define those things? Exactly. We probably don't need it. And uh, I think the, the previous comment is, is how we'll proceed, because the person who raised this, uh, Leora Morgenstern, can't make this week's call. And I want to be sure that when somebody uh, raises something, that we get back to them and say, look, we've worked out we don't need this thing, or what did you need it for? I will get back to her and see if we can find what exactly is the problem we're trying to solve. Because if it was just a joint venture, then I have a proposal which I'm coming to now, which would be a better place to put joint venture, I think. Well, let's see it. OK. So uh, here is uh, the diagram which defines uh, within organization what it means to be a formal organization and what distinguishes a formal organization from an informal organization. And remember, organization is something which is itself an autonomous entity. That's what makes it not a group. Um, so what makes a formal organization is it's covered by some kind of contract, which we call an organization covering agreement, for want of a better word. So for example, the partnership agreement between the partners in the partnership, uh, it's that which essentially makes it a partnership. It doesn't make it a, a legal um, person. It doesn't uh, give it uh, the, the, the legal ability to acquire liability. But what it does do is define the relationship among the principles. With trust, which we'll come on to in detail next, there's a very uh, specific form of covering agreement for trust called a deed, and the deed defines uh, usually will vary by jurisdiction, but three specific uh, roles that different entities have, and again the uh, the liabilities they have well, within and among themselves, and so on. Um, and even legal persons like incorporated companies also have directors' agreements of things, uh, which give which which make them firmly a kind of formal organization as well as a kind of uh, legal person or, or liable entity. So it seems to me that something like a joint venture is, as the previous speaker said, exactly like a partnership, except the partners are not individual people, they're companies. So I would suggest that joint venture would be a kind of formal organization, the principles of which are either incorporated companies or possibly any kind of body corporate. That's something we could do with finding out. But that's my proposal for how joint venture would be defined and how it would not use group at all. Any thoughts on that, please? I think this gets it closer to better describing what a joint venture is than the entities group approach. I'm not okay. sure how it fits into yeah. your other I'm not sure how it fits into your other drawing with legal person and liable entities and stuff, but I think this is it definitely gets us closer. Fantastic, thank you. Yes, and uh, yeah, I, I wasn't going to suggest that we use entities group. I think it was what was suggested when we added that to the model. And if that's the only reason for it, then we'll, we'll put it out of scope. I'm just going to find where the hell organization lives. Uh, Mike. A moment while I... Yes, Carol. Sorry, Bob Smith. There's another question from you or comment? Go ahead, Bob. Bob, your line is released from this end. Hi, I apologize for being so chatty. The, the point I wanted to make was that it might be useful for us to develop a kind of checklist uh, for each of these uh, entities, such that, for instance, um, you would say, if it can uh, accept a liability, then it is a liable entity. If it, yep. if it does have the ability to enter into contracts, then it is a uh, uh, legal entity. Um, because so often people will use terms like joint venture or partnership or trust very loosely 
And until you look mm -hmm. into the actual organizing contract, it's hard to know where an individual, uh, an individual instance should be located. And I think that the, the labels are useful, and I'm not arguing to eliminate the labels, but I, I, what I am arguing for is that when we establish a new type like joint venture, that it that a kind of uh, checklist be developed. Well, if it meets this criteria, this criteria, this criteria, then it is a it is a joint venture. Right. Yes, please. Um, uh, so what you're saying is the actual label like joint venture could be applied quite loosely in the wild, and we need to define something which is not only the the most useful. Uh, um, version of that, but it has specific facts so that it's pretty clear when you're referring to something as a joint venture per the definition here in FIBO, the properties that make it a joint venture are, are clear and unambiguous, even if somebody else might then go on to call something else a joint venture, we can say, well, according to FIBO, it's not what we call a joint venture, because this is what we mean by it. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly, and because I, I think that um, sometimes if we if we start with the label that somebody gives something and then try to push that instance into them, you know, find the place for that instance in your model, um, we can generate a lot of confusion. Whereas if we rather base it on first principles like can, uh, can be liable, then um, it becomes pretty clear where things go. And, it, and we, we might wind up in a situation where somebody walks off in a huff and says, well, I call that a joint venture. Um, well, that's fine. That's what you call it. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to get into you know a labeling argument here, semiotics, you know, argument. Um, but you don't meet the criteria. You're a square peg in this round hole, you know. So yeah. what we just we want to be sure and, and have are are these sort of first principle things. If you if you walk like a duck, if you quack like a duck, you're a duck. Yep. Absolutely, and, and that's the, <laughs> that's the whole I, I, philosophy I, 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 of. No, that's fantastic. That's the whole philosophy of, uh, of, of what we're trying to do. Um, that's a good point, yeah. Mm, and uh, in fact, uh, this goes back to something that, that uh, Mike Atkins said some years ago now, that uh, you can get people to argue forever about what word to use, but actually if you focus them on what are the meaningful concepts, and they're aware that for that concept you can have many synonyms, and so sometimes the same word can be used for other concepts, but you get the concepts right, then actually there's a lot less argument because if any argument there is just becomes about which label somebody uses and you go well so use that label you know uh, but we get the concepts right so that's a very powerful point and uh, fundamental to, to what we're trying to do so so thank you but I think I cut you off I didn't mean to we, we, was there more you wanted to add to that or, or specific properties perhaps you want to propose to joint mm -hmm. venture no I'm, I'm perfectly satisfied and I, and I like the way things are going here I, I appreciate y'all's attention Fantastic. Thank you very much for your, for your comment. Um, okay, so I'm suggesting joint venture as a kind of formal organization. Now, um, as such, it's governed by some govern, some covering agreement. Uh, now, there are joint ventures which are between incorporated companies uh, where you have uh, um, some common ownership of shares between them or you know, the joint venture uh, has a 50-50 share split with, with uh, the two entities or something, um, but is that too narrow? Can a joint venture be with any uh, liable entity uh, or indeed any legal entity? Can you have a joint venture where well, one of the uh, participants in that venture is a non-incorporated entity, or would that be something that we would not call a joint venture? Um, you know, so that's. Uh, question I'd like to think about, you know, there, or is it something we need to find out more or find out what different people see as the scope of what they mean by joint venture and find you know, what are the properties we want to pin down for that so we have a clearly defined concept which is, uh, covers as much as possible of the usage of that without making it become vague. So should the participants be any uh, legal person, any non-human legal person, or are they always incorporated companies? Can you have a joint venture other than through share ownership, for example? Because if not, then it would always be joint incorporated companies as the members of the joint venture. Uh, what's people's understanding of that? Yeah. 
So what is the range of kinds of entities? A, B. And what do you call them? Partners, don't you? Partners in a joint venture. Do we know or do we need to research it? Or is it so obvious that nobody's saying it because I ought to know it myself? Maybe, maybe we need a little research on kind of the legal definition of joint venture. Then. Right. Anybody on the call know the legal definition? If not, I'll take an action to research that. Fantastic. Good. And then that uh, puts us back in its, uh, its proper place. Fantastic. Um, and we all agreed that it's a kind of formal organization. Uh, I didn't hear any shouting against that when I put it there. Does it make sense to everybody? Cool. That sounds very good. Um, right. Now, um, just to recheck our agenda, we have half an hour to go. So what were the changes we did? Have we validated them all? Um, that we have, apart from the fun stuff, facts about organizations, concepts of grouping, we've talked about that, we've validated it <laughs> in a negative sense, we don't want to use it unless somebody has a good reason for it, and we certainly mustn't let people fund things in it, if we do keep it, it, it gets hidden. Um, so, are we, is there any other areas of that people want to look at from, from last week's comments? Uh, I know there's a lot of comments in the spreadsheet, and it's, you know, um, Hard to do justice to them all, perhaps, and I'm sure there's many nuances that I've missed. Um, we talked about things like relative entities last time as well, entities in some role and so on. I can go over that a bit more if, if we want to. Or are we ready to, to move on to look at some of the uh, fund-related uh, questions and, and uh, start setting up the agenda for that? So, Mike, this is Julian again. Um, Hi, Julian. I hesitated to ask this question but because I didn't want to kind of blow things up, but. I guess I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, if you could go back to, I don't know which uh, picture it was that had libel entity and legal entity and all that good stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm waiting for, waiting for my screen to reach. Okay. So, yeah. and maybe it's not worth it, but I did just want to ask a question. So, you defined partnership and trust as being things that cannot accrue liability. Is that yes. really true or do they accrue liability but that liability is passed through to the constituent oh. partner? So they're still accruing but exactly. you know at the end of the day they're not the ones who end up paying, right? It's the constituent partners. And if that is the case, uh, again, I was hesitant to make this comment because it kind of blows up your picture, but maybe it simplifies the picture. I'll give you a second mm -hmm. to write this down. Um, yes, I've been struggling with this for a while. So a legal person did explain the scenario to me, and it's pretty much exactly in line with what you're saying, but I've been struggling with the same question you brought up here, which is when to use the word accrue about it and when not to. And I'm not at all confident that I'm using the word accrue liability correctly. We do know that there are things which can enter into contracts where the liability is passed through and things where the liability ends up. Is accrue the right word to use for describing where the liability ends up or is there some better legal word for it? I really want to know. But even even so, uh, if, if, if what I'm saying is correct, and I don't know, again, I'm not mm -hmm. a lawyer, um, then you could almost, and this was my hesitancy, you could almost eliminate these subclasses and just simply have libel entity, but a libel entity may have another relationship where it passes the liability on to another entity or to itself, right, if oh. it doesn't pass it on. Um, and that could genericize this a bit more. I don't know if you want to go in that direction, so I'm going to, and I don't, oh. I haven't convinced myself yet of that, but I thought I'd throw that out there, that, you know, a liable entity can pass that liability on to somebody else, which might be its uh -huh. constituent partners, 
um, or it just keeps it for itself, right? And, and then you could eliminate yeah. some of the stuff in the picture. And I'm just going to leave it right. at that. Food for thought. I, I like that. I think uh, I'm not sure it will necessarily change the picture, but um, it may change our labeling because when we say liable entity or when we previously said legal person, we meant the thing that, for want of a better word, holds the liability. Um, legal entity is anything that enters into a contract, so clearly it's anything which can incur liability. Perhaps accrue is the right word at that level, perhaps accrue is the right word at that, that level, perhaps it's the wrong word completely. I don't know. Ah. Um, but what I do know, there are, as you say, entities where, and we haven't put this in, this would be really useful to put in actually, that for a liable or legal entry, whatever you want to call it, um, the fact we haven't tracked is that if it's one of these ones that the liability doesn't end up at, then there should be a relationship to this legal person construct here, the thing where it does end up. Uh, we right. have a unit holder here, but that's not the relationship we have in mind. So there's a missing set of relationships. Perhaps we actually need a grouping for entities that pass through liability. Yeah, may maybe. That, that would make sense. Yeah, so maybe you explore the notion of accruing versus who's actually ultimately responsible for it. Maybe that's the yeah. distinction. I, again, I don't know if those are the right words, mm. but you're right, you kind of say yeah. who's responsible for it ultimately. I don't know. That is the, yeah, I don't know exactly which are the right words, but that's exactly what, what we're saying here. And I, like you, don't know which are the most accurate words to use to say it, but we're both saying the same thing. Um, but it is a good question whether then we should group these non <coughs> Uh, the ones where, as this uh, lawyer put it to me once, the liability comes initially to their threshold, and it's what happens behind the threshold that may differ between a uh, entity that is a legal person in law and an entity that is not. <coughs> mm. So you need to group them up and put a relationship from them to this entity, and are we still happy with liable entity being our word for legal person, or is what we thought was unambiguous actually could be equally uh, label for legal entity? Should we go? I think back to Mike Atkins' earlier point, where maybe we should stick to the, the legal terms as they're as they're used in law, um, even though that term legal person has been interpreted in three different ways, as has legal entity by different uh, audiences. Mike. Can I interject? Yes, I have two things. Mm. Um, yep. I have, first of all, a question from Jefferson Braswell um, saying joint several liability versus tenants in common. Um, I will try and release Jefferson's nut line. And then also, on top of that, Phil Lee has something to say as well. So, Right. Let me just drop down a note. And uh, Jefferson, uh, could you clarify, uh, explain that, please? Because this, this could be something that we. Uh, oh, he hasn't got a microphone. Um, okay. So, what do you mean by tenants in common? Are you able to put that in the chat window or something, Jefferson? I have released your line if you've got a, a speaker. He doesn't there. have a microphone, Carol. Okay. Jefferson doesn't have a microphone. Oh. Oh, I stand corrected. <laughs> Are you there? Hello. Hi, you made it. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking that there are cases in which uh, there's a distinction between, uh, say, organizations that have um, uh, co-ops. Uh, they, 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 the entity has a has a responsibility, but there are also members that are tenants in common. Uh, but there's also uh -huh. joint joint versus several liability, which. Uh, uh, parties are operating together under an agreement, and if one person is liable, they all become liable. Yeah, now, that's a very good point. I've I've come across joint and several liability in the context of uh, partnerships, and also when you open a bank account for an informal organisation like a political party or something, uh, typically the bank will also make the principal joint and several liable. But something I've ignored, which you've just uh, brought to my attention, is that if there's joint and several liability, then surely there's joint liability. And there's several liability, and those are se separate things. Is that uh, the gist of what you're saying? No, you can't separate them in law. In law, they're inseparable. That's hence ah. the term joint and several. There is no legal distinction between the joint liability and the individual liability of each party in that context. 
Right. So, is, so joint and several is really one term, not two, and it cannot be separated yeah. out. That's correct. Right. Okay. So then joint and several liability is what we uh, have understood for partnerships, although I haven't attempted to, to model the nature of it. Uh, what is the difference then with this tenants in common thing? Is that some other type of liability other than joint and several liability? Uh, well, once again, I'm not a lawyer either, but I know that that is there are difference. Uh, one can one can say that if someone else in a uh, tenants in common situation uh, causes something that that you are not necessarily liable. Uh, let's say that someone in a uh, <coughs> another owner of a, of a uh, condo in a unit uh, does something that yeah. uh, did not involve you. <coughs> yeah. But I, I guess the. The, the thought about the partnership, it would seem that the, the joint ventures uh, or agreements between uh, parties, mm -hmm. certainly when they are when they are sued by folks, they uh, uh, those who would like to uh, to see uh, some type of uh, recourse are going to try and involve more than one party, and they will try to bring in all those who they think might be liable. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, so the concept of the joint and several so would, would seem to uh, defeat a little bit the notion of the pass-through in the sense that it would certainly be a legal approach that would uh, uh, try and defeat that. Oh. Yeah. Hi, it's, it's Phil here. If you want to know the difference between, for example, tenants in common and a joint tenancy, yep. in a yep. joint tenancy, uh, property is jointly and severally owned and there's no concept of who owns how much of it. Everybody owns all of it. Whereas in a tenants in common, you have to specify exactly what percentage of the thing each party owns. Ah, right. Okay. So here's a thought on all, on all of this, which is that, um, let me just write that down, what percentage someone owns. Because um, this, I think, confirms what I was beginning to think might be the answer to this, which is that in any formal organization, that organization has some uh, uh, formal contract between the principals. Um, one of the things that would be in that contract would be the disposition of liability among those principals. Again, in a trust, there's a fairly standard form for that, with different uh, responsibilities and liabilities and so on, defined in a fairly standard way. But in any partnership, in even in a director's agreement within a, 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 a limited company, um, presumably in tenants in common, uh, you would have a contract between all these principles so that when somebody comes to sue the entity, that contract will define how that liability unwinds. Is that correct or is that not? Or does the court end up deciding without reference to such a contract? In a, in a tenancy in common, say, what, say you have two mm -hmm. people who own a property and one owns 70%, the other owns 30%, say. Yep. Yeah? Yep. If you then sue them jointly and, you, and, and they end up having to pay a million dollars, then the one who owns seventy yeah. percent is going to have to pay seven hundred thousand, and the one who owns thirty percent is going to have to pay the three hundred thousand. Right. Thank you. So, in tenants in common, and presumably in any analogous arrangements within uh, the finance industry, like perhaps certain kinds of uh, funds or something, a similar thing would apply. You have a percentage of ownership, which also becomes your percentage of liability um, when things go wrong. Right. Well, yeah, Thank which you. is complete. Which is completely different to the joint and several concept. Yeah, where everybody right. is completely liable for the whole amount. Yeah. And what mechanizes that difference? Is it the existence of a contract that makes you tenants in common, and does the contract define that percentage? It's, it's been a legal, it's other legal kind of agreement. Instance? Right. It's a, legal, it's a legal agreement between the parties to define the tenancy in this particular case. Right. Fantastic. Just like a joint mortgage. Where, where where you define a percentage interest as opposed to having it joint and several, which is the normal UK mortgage for partner. Yeah. Yes. Good. That's the answer I was hoping for. But it relates, the key thing here is that that relates specifically and only to the ownership mm -hmm. of assets, be oh. them buildings, ships, aeroplanes, or whatever. Oh. It's to do with the physical ownership of a thing. And therefore, it's not your liability, but your loss, uh, given that that liability is called in, which is, uh, well, is yeah, right? it's, it's not really a liability in that sense. Yeah. 
a joint tenancy isn't an independent entity. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, but what I'm getting at is, is it a uh, let's see if I can find the other diagram, a formal organisation, which is any organisation that's not the right diagram, any organisation that um, has some right, sorry, there is, some formal agreement, which is what makes it a formal organisation. Uh, do we need to perhaps even model things within that? Uh, I don't diagram. think it is personally. I don't. I don't think. It, I don't think it's any form of organisation, uh, Mike. I think. Uh -huh. I right. think it's an agreement. It's an agreement between parties. Right. Ah. So what we have at the about, moment is. Sorry. Yeah. Go on. Go on. Yep. I was going to say, if you're talking about, if we're talking specifically about tenancies and things like that, then there are agreements between parties. A tenancy can't enter into a contract. A tenancy is an agreement between parties related to some other thing. Right, so it does not create Usually an organisation, yes. There's a, there's a couple of questions, I think, or comments raised. Okay, fantastic. Let me just get on to those. So just, yeah. to, just to close out this point then, um, to be uh, something like a, um, a, a ten the tenancy kind of arrangement, which is slightly outside of our current scope, but there may be parallels to it, where there's some other pattern than joint and several liability, it doesn't, it doesn't describe a formal organisation anyway. In fact, it describes a group. So if we were to look at tenancy, which we will for things like the MISMO uh, you know, mortgage terms and so on, then we'll be looking at groups that have covering agreements. An organisation that has a covering agreement is something which has a covering agreement and is an organisation which is therefore a autonomous thing. And yeah. the tenants in common type of liability doesn't apply to that, so the passing through of liability is always on a joint and several basis. Um, are there cases where there are agreements which change liability at all, or does that just never happen? You can only have what you just described, where it's uh, ownership and uh, potential loss well, covered by the covering agreement, not the liability. In the UK, a true partnership, as opposed to one that's limited by shares or guarantees, is exactly that. That's an agreement between parties to jointly and severally share liability. Right. So it's by definition perfect, an agreement to jointly and severally share liability. Right, fantastic. So I think we're starting to work towards some of the concepts that we'll now be able to look at in terms of trusts and so on, which will set us up for going forward uh, on, on fund-related entities. But first, uh, we, I have two or three questions queued up. So uh, who, who first? Bob Smith. Yeah, uh, th thank you. And first of all, I wanted to encourage this conversation. I'm, I'm not able to participate because of the, the legal nature of it, but um, at the same time, uh, I, I just wanted to raise a, a yellow flag that we, we might be getting into um, questions that are not really relevant to the, the construction of this model, and um, I, I, it, it's sometimes it's very difficult when creating a model in abstract uh, out of mm -hmm. the context of, say, some particular purpose, you know, a, a particular system one might be trying to create or something. Um, so I, I, I know that it's difficult to know where this line is drawn. For instance, I think if, if the point we're driving at would create a simplification merging the liable person with the legal entity, then I think, it's, mm -hmm. I think this is a great conversation, you know, or validate the distinction between the two. I think this is a great conversation, but, but um, I, I just wanted to draw everybody's attention to the fact that, you know, if we get too far into the individual contracts, then we might be way out of scope. Right, thank you. Uh, just as a, a quick comment to, 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 to that, I think uh, I needed to know what this tenants in common thing was in order to know whether it was relevant or not to things like partnership, and the answer is obviously that it is not. However, this knowledge will be applied when we start looking at terms to do with mortgages and real estate and you know, the loans uh, semantics uh, some months down the line. So this knowledge uh, is a being very useful in narrowing down what is or isn't a formal organisation like a partnership or a joint venture, and b it's opened up the kind of legal nuances we will need in the future. So uh, don't expect to see tenants in common anywhere in this part of the model, 
but it's been very valuable knowledge in helping us work out what is or is not covered by this formal organization thing. Uh, does that make sense? <clears throat> yeah, uh, absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you. Victoria yeah. Starr now. Victoria, can your voice, can, or rather your line has been uh, released? No, maybe she's got a problem with sounds. Uh, the okay, comments, well, can she, you see? She's the... written her comment down, yes. It seems that the concepts of ownership, brackets, types of, and liability, brackets, types of, are being treated the same, are they? Uh, that is very much the question. I think uh, in trying to dive into this whole, um, you know, uh, tenants in common versus joint and several liability, uh, I was trying to find out whether uh, the agreement that would define the, the breakdown in ownership would or would not affect liability. And the answer I got from somebody in, in that conversation was, uh, no, they are two completely separate things. That was a very valuable piece of new knowledge, uh, which uh, we didn't know coming into this. So uh, that's that's the answer. Does that uh, does that make sense? So they're not being treated the same. That's what we now learn. Hello, hello. This is Victor Starr. I don't know if you can Hi. hear me. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I was quite uh, wondering about that. Okay. And then the second comment I have is um, when you discuss the organization. Mm -hmm. And if it includes the ownership and liability for owned assets from the comment previous, is this covered yeah. by this organization covering agreement? And therefore, does the agreement implicitly cover liability for actions of the organization? This might be a little bit specific, but I'm I'm trying to understand where the flow of the discussion is going with this. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, I think there's, there's two answers to that. I think, firstly, um, the covering agreement, I don't know exactly what it covers or doesn't. It could cover anything. At the moment, we're simply using it as a way of indicating that the existence of such a thing is what makes you a formal organization. And we have another part of the model where there are subclasses of these that define what is a partnership, what is a trust, by showing their relationship is governed by a relationship to subclasses of this organization covering agreement. We've not attempted to model what's in them. We've simply used it as a an indicator, again, almost a flag, and you'd probably have a, a yes-no Boolean flag in an application instead of necessarily having to refer to the contract. Um, but there is potential, uh, perhaps in the future, for uh, uh, unpacking some of what's in these. Uh, we're not ready to do that now. We've been looking at uh, very different contracts, things like uh, master agreements in derivatives trading, where, again, we want to uh, uh, find a good way of unpacking the semantics of the contractual terms, so the rights, the obligations, the liabilities, the divisions, the conditions, all these different kinds of things that may be in a contract. And in so doing, we may be able to better formalize things like the nature of what goes in a trust agreement, for example. So I think there is potential for unpacking some of that. So at the moment, I'm just using it as a kind of a thing to say, you know, this is a formal organization because it has the property that it is governed by some organizational covering agreement, and I've put nothing inside that at all. Does that answer your question at all? That's helpful, thank you. Fantastic, thank you. So, yeah, I'd like people's views perhaps on the uh, follow-up emails or whatever as to uh, how much or whether or how soon to unpack some of the, uh, the things inside of these, or, or whether we need to or not, because clearly they'll cover everything from principles to termination clauses and everything in between, including shares of assets, including uh, um, the fact of joint and several liability um, in the case of partnership and so on. I might see if I can put some of that in into the, um, the more formal models that we have that in, in fact. Uh, next question, please. Somebody else had a, a question. No, I think that was it. Raise your hands otherwise, or please. Oh, right. Button. Sorry. Yes, I so think there was the answered. second question in the chat was also Vicky. Yes. Thanks, Vicky. I think there was a little stuff. I didn't look at the names and see that your question was, was also the next one. Good. So, yeah, just to clarify that on the um, some of the more uh, noisy diagrams that are here, we have the breakdown of this organization covering agreement into partnership agreement, board agreement. Uh, foundations I'm a bit puzzled about because I'm not completely sure if they're legal uh, persons which have some legal instrument, these dark gray things that cause them to exist, or whether they're you know, something less formal which just has some kind of agreement or, or both. So uh, something to come on to when you look at funds and so on is foundations, trusts, all of these things. Um, 
partnerships and so on. Good. So um, we've got 10 minutes to go. Um, the next thing we wanted to cover, and I, I, I'm really, I think we've made huge progress today in terms of getting the fundamentals, getting a common understanding of what goes where and so on. Um, do we have time to look at some of the uh, basic uh, um, stuff to do with uh, funds and collective investment vehicles? Um, or why, why don't you give us the broad conceptual overview of funds, Mike, and let people understand the model structure and anything mm -hmm. they might need to look at because we want to talk about that next time. Fantastic. Thanks, Mike. So um, there's two aspects to, to, to funds. One is the very detailed draft model of funds themselves, which we worked on a couple of years ago with a lot of help from uh, a group called IFARMA, the European Fund and Asset Management Association. We did a very detailed uh, uh, semantic review of that. Um, it's a very complex model. Um, the other thing, and our immediate concern, is fund-related entities so that we know you know, we've agreed that uh, the scope of this release of five open business entities should include those entities that are relevant to funds. And so um, there's the fund model and there's the fund-related uh, business entities, the two things to, to look at. So I've pulled together in this diagram here just a few of the concepts that are already in the um, fund model itself. Um, it's a much bigger model than this, but these are the basic concepts. And I want to start with uh, a basic observation that the word fund can be used interchangeably to describe three completely different things. And so uh, rather like our earlier point about uh, you know, once we've defined the properties of what something is, um, people can use different labels as, as they see fit. You know, the label uh, isn't, isn't the meaning. And sometimes people use a word to cover a less well-defined range of concepts than just one concept. Funds is a very good example for that. So sometimes when we talk about the fund, we're talking about some instrument, some contract, perhaps that has an item and so on. It's a thing you can trade, and that's the fund. Sometimes when we talk about a fund, we're talking about the fundamental nature of what the fund is, which is a pool of assets. Uh, and sometimes we talk about a fund, we're talking about some legal form some entity which is itself the fund, and that could be a joint stock company, uh, sometimes it's an entity created by a contract, and I think some of the stuff we're just looking at with uh, kinds of uh, uh, um, covering agreement that create organizations can be unpacked here to define those kinds of funds. Sometimes it's a fund special purpose vehicle, which is the kind of entity defined in the context of being funds and could take on various uh, forms. Um, so. Those three things then, the fund as a kind of entity, the fund as a pool of assets, and the fund as a kind of instrument, um, are all three ones where sometimes the word fund will refer to any of those three. Uh, so here we've used the word fund to describe the pool, we use fund unit, and there's a whole set of subclasses of this, of uh, debt units and equity units and so on. Um, and I suspect that the parent should actually be security rather than directly to transfer over contracts. I'm not sure why the model is like that. Um, then we have the entities. This is the stuff we're interested in. And now this is a bit messy because this is what's currently in the in the in the model uh, from the funds model from two years ago, interacting with the uh, up-to-date legal entities model with all the changes we've done since then. So um, this is a bit untidy as it stands. But I think one thing, at least the, the business thinking, is reasonably clear here is that the fund always has a legal form, but that legal form could be this this little icon here just stands for a kind of logical union of, of these things. Basically, it has to be one of these kinds of things. A fund, special purpose vehicle, uh, an incorporated company, a joint stock company as a kind of incorporated company, or a uh, some kind of legal contract which creates the fund. So um, these are the entities we need to uh, think about next time. Now, what wasn't in the model when we first did funds, when that set of relationships were first set up, is that special purpose vehicles, as we saw last time, we've now got this concept of uh, uh, relative concept, uh, uh, functional business entities, which are kind of relative things, like the final diagram we've been in. This is entities which could actually take on one of several possible forms, and the nature of the entity isn't dependent on it being that form. So as an example, 
Uh, in fact, I'll give you two very different examples. I can't find the diagram. Um, the distinction between, say, a business and a non-profit is independent of whether that business or that non-profit is a, uh, in the case of business, it could be a sole trader, it could be a partnership, it could be a limited company. Being a business and being of that physical form are two different things. Non-profits are interesting because in the United Kingdom, you have an organization that already exists that may or may not be a legal person or a liable entity, and it then registers to become a non-profit, whereas in, if I understand it right, in the United States, you actually register a kind of limited company which is a non-profit. So in that case, in the United States example, that would be a subclass of uh, limited company or, or, or some such thing, depending on the exact physical form. But in many other jurisdictions, including uh, England and Wales, for example, a non-profit is in fact a, uh, it can be anything that already exists as an organization and then it takes some form. So all these functional entities are things that take some form. At the highest level, there can be any autonomous entity. That may be Mike, Mike. Higher. Yeah. Mike, it's Phil here. Yeah. Where did you yeah, get Phil. that rather, to me, bizarre definition of a UK non-profit organization? Because that's completely at odds with my understanding of how things work. In oh, the well, I, I, I know people who registered as, as uh, uh, registered charities, and yeah, yeah, they existed as a... Mm -hmm. A registered charity is yep. actually a legal form. Yeah. So ah. just as in the US, you have to you register with the Charities Commission and with Companies House as a registered charity. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting because I have come across organisations that have existed and have then uh, become uh, charities. So I always thought that the charity was a role that the organisation fulfils. You can but do if that. That's not correct. That's not correct. I mean, you can do that. that. Fraudulent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You, you can do that, but you have to change your articles of association. Oh, you know? right. Okay. So if you change your articles of association, then you're quite right. It becomes a, 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 sub, uh, a subclass, a, a physical form, just like it is in the United States. Yeah. That is very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. But yes, so I was hoping that would be a, a reasonable example to explain how this concept of relative entities works, but I guess it wasn't. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah. I always thought that it was required to be some kind of legal entity, but didn't start off in life as a legal entity the way that a limited company would. Um, but if you change your articles of association, then you're becoming a new entity with a new physical form right there and then. And so you would, you're quite right, be a subclass of legal entities. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's very interesting. Um, but in general, these are things which uh, are defined by uh, some role or function, and which may take several forms. And with funds, this is going to be quite difficult to unpack because some kinds of fund entity may well be, like the registered charity, actual kinds of entities, and some may be something which can take on one of several legal forms but is by its function some kind of fund. And I don't know which is which any more than I knew which was which about uh, 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 non-profits, for example. So we have the idea of a special purpose vehicle which is some vehicle which needs to be some kind of uh, uh, liable entity, and that includes a debt FTV, a security issuance FTV, and a funds FTV. And what we need to know and find out between now and next week is whether these, and this will vary from one jurisdiction to another quite significantly, I think, but whether, for example, uh, particular kinds of fund are always a joint stock company or are always a, a legal person. Um, or are always a trust. So I think, for example, a trust fund, including in the name, will always be a trust. Or whether there are some kinds of SPV where being the SPV is, you know, a, a, a definition based on your function, and then it can take one of several forms. So that's, that's where there's a lot of work. Ah, that is correct, is it? Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. That's yeah, special purpose vehicle is the is the role that the organization has chosen to play. It's got nothing to do with its legal form. could have any legal Fantastic. Form. Fantastic, because that's exactly what I've modeled here, and I just needed to know if that was correct or not. Yep, certainly is. Fantastic. Um, Mike, you were, you were at 10.30. Let's, not, let's make sure we keep yep. to our promises. Yep, well, that's that's fantastic. So that's, that's what I wanted, and thank you for confirming that I actually at least got this part of the model right. Um, <laughs> and uh, we're ready to dive in next week with uh, uh, unpacking this. I think um, I'll give you enough background that hopefully 
uh, so the, these 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 um, um this model is on the uh, semantics repository under CIV or under funds. Where is it? Right. The 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 detailed model of of, of CIV is in fact under uh, it's, it's called funds back at CIV just here, um, and that hasn't changed for years. You see the diagrams here, um, which show the, the basic overview of them. Um, quite complex. Um, the uh, the changes we've made from uh, last week and this week uh, and the basic taxonomy, now that we've got that uh, pretty stable, I'll be uh, um, tinkering with that over the next day or so and get that uploaded. Uh, so expect to see the notes from this session and an upload of the diagram and everything for business entities in the business entity section. Um, so can, that can, I, can I suggest that when we send out when we send out our notes about this, we uh, we set up the core themes that you'd like to talk about for funds to get people right. oriented when they walk in next week. But so uh, this is a very complex area. We want to make sure we manage this one um, um, in a structured way, if we can. Will do. Good. I, I think that should call it to a uh, a close. Once again, uh, if you have um, additional comments, please feel free to dial Mike directly or send him a note. He will log it and get back to you. Uh, and uh, with that, thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next week. Thanks, Mark. Thanks.